Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. I am so thankful that you are listening today. I am still sick, if you can't tell by my voice. It's very croaky. And again, I sound like a frog. And my ears are blocked as well. So my hearing is a little off. But hey, we're managing and we're here and we're doing the thing. Okay, we're doing the thing. So this is a place where I talk about health and wellness and biohacking and kind of everything that I'm into in this space. I bring on guests and I interview them about all of the healthy things that they are up to. And then I also do solo episodes on various topics and a lot of Q&A episodes and that type of thing. Episodes come out every Tuesday and Friday. And yeah, we're we're rolling this <laughs> Life is so crazy right now. If you follow me on Instagram, you probably have noticed there is a lot going on. We are moving and our condo went up for sale this week. So we're kind of navigating that. My husband and I are both sick, which we never, ever get sick. Like we get sick, I don't even know, once a year, maybe hardly ever. And my husband's grandfather passed away last week. So he is not with me right now. He's at the funeral. He's in Ontario, in, like outside of Toronto. And so life is just like, you know, full on. You know that song that goes like, life in the fast lane? Like that is what is playing in my head <laughs> lately because it's literally life in the fast lane. And I am not surprised at all that we are sick. We are, we have been working so hard since we've come off of the Christmas break. And then coupled with how busy our personal life is right now with buying a new house, with moving and figuring out a cross-country move and other things that we have going on. Like it's, it wasn't surprising when I was like, oh, I think I feel something in my throat. And it just goes to show you that you really can't just run on all cylinders all the time without slowing down because your body will demand better from you. Your body will force you to slow down and stop and breathe and relax. So that is what has happened. The stress levels, I think, are too much. And not even that I feel stressed or un- or unhappy or anything like that, which I have felt before. It's more of like, there's so much to do that there's not a not, there's not a lot of time for doing nothing or doing less or doing more calming activities. And this is kind of how I felt actually last year when I was, I was working a job, I was running my business full time and I was planning our wedding, which was like a part-time job. This is how I felt was like, I felt like I had three jobs every single week and I couldn't keep up with anything. And that's kind of how I've felt lately. And I think he's felt the same. And so it's not surprising that we're just down and out for the count. And then obviously coupled with like a family member passing away is really hard emotionally. And so that's just kind of the reality of things right now. We are heading to Tofino on Wednesday, which is a small town. It's a little beach town. It's got like 2,000 people. It's beautiful. It's probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite spots in Canada. It is just magnificent. Like it, it really is. I can't even say enough good things about it. I We try to go every single year and you are, you just feel so off grid there. You feel very connected to nature and humbled and it's such a good break and we had this little vacation planned prior to all of this stuff that's recently happened so it's like really nice timing to be able to take some days off and be off from for um, i think we're off from wednesday to sunday for the rest of this week so hopefully we feel better by then we can take time to recharge and reconnect and i'm really looking forward to it because i really need it and so does he And we have learned that we are the type of people who really do need to plan our vacations. Otherwise, we won't take them. So we really do have to just book it and say, you know, in this month, we're going to go to this place and just do it instead of 
trying to book something later on or seeing what would happen and then decide or trying to figure out the perfect time to go. It doesn't really work for us when we try to do that. It just works when we book it, put in the calendar and now it's done. And then we stick to the plan. (laughs) So that's what we have coming up. And I'm really looking forward to that. And yeah, that's this month is a lot, but a lot in a good way. I am working on my baby steps course and I'm so excited about this. I post a lot about this actually on TikTok because TikTok has this community that I like tapped into more than Instagram, I would say, where I get to talk about preconception health more. So it's it's biohacking, but it's more specific biohacking and it's all about fertility and how do we how do we optimize that time in our life? How do we you know how do we become healthier so that we can get pregnant faster, have a successful pregnancy, healthier baby, healthier birth, all of these things. And that's where I talk a lot about it. And I'm developing my course that goes along with this. It's launching this month to everybody on the wait list. And if you are on the wait list, you get $100 off the course. And I'm really excited about that. That is the biggest discount you will ever get, ever, 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 ever get. So if I do discounts in the future, which I probably will, it will be, who knows? you know, $50 off. I don't know. I have no idea, but it will not be this substantial. So this is just for all of those early bird eager people who've been waiting. And I just want to honor them and say, Hey, look, I see you and you get this nice juicy discount for being on the wait list. And the wait list is on my website. It's in the link in my bio. It's in the show notes. It's everywhere. It's really easy to find. If you still can't find it, send me a message and I will get it to you ASAP. Speaking of all of the things that I do, all of the content that I produce is kind of summarized every single week in a newsletter. Newsletter goes out typically Thursday or Friday. I'm trying to move it to more of a Thursday thing. And you can join this as well. I think there's almost 9,000 people on my newsletter list. And I love the newsletter. I actually just redid it. (laughs) And it's really beautiful. I I don't say so myself. So this is a place where I recap my latest podcast episode, the biohacking in the news little corner that I have. So I'm always watching the news, like news articles that come out about biohacking. So I will link to those articles. So things like, you know, if there's something in a different magazine or a different website or Forbes or anything like that, I'll put the the photo, typically the title and the link, something like that. And it just kind of keeps you aware of what's going on. Then I also link my, you know, latest social content and other things that are going on. And it's just like a nice place that kind of summarizes everything for the week. And that's why I think there's so many people on that list. So if you want to join that, you can join that on my website. Again, feel free. And that is one of my go-to places. So before we dive into today's episode, a shout out to Buy Optimizers. Holy moly. Am I relying on their products right now when I'm sick? Especially their probiotics. So I actually went through my supplements the other day and I was rereading the recommended dosages of things just to make sure I was actually taking what I should be taking. And so with the bio-optimizers, it I'm taking a probiotic and it actually recommends two probiotics per meal. And so like which you could do once a day if you wanted to, like as a maintenance type of thing. But right now when I'm sick, I'm actually taking two probiotics every single meal that I take. And it's been really, really helpful. So that's what I'm doing when I'm sick right now. I'm also, I've also increased my magnesium and I'm taking three to four at night to help with sleep because I wake up, I have a dry mouth, which sucks. So I'm sleeping, breathing through my mouth right now, which is awful. And I hate being a mouth breather. Anyway, so I'm taking their magnesium to help me sleep. And it's fabulous. It's like my go-to magnesium. I recommend it to every single person underneath the sun, especially when you're down and out, kind of like I am right now. And it also helps manage stress levels. And then what else am I taking? Their digestive enzymes, their sleep aid, which is like a mixed drink at night, which is really good as well. And then I've also increased my NAC. So NAC is N-acetyl cysteine, which is not from Bioptimizers, but is a different company. And this just helps with producing 
mucus in the body, not in a way that like it increases it, but more in a way that it helps to thin it. So this has been really helpful for me. And I always take NAC actually. Like NAC has been one of those supplements that I kind of take every single day, no matter what. So now I'm just kind of increasing it as well, just to help with keeping the mucus flowing and getting it out of my body type of idea. So definitely check out that if you're interested. With Bioptimizers, you can use my discount code BIOHACKINGBRITTANY in all capitals. That will get you the most discount. It's also linked everywhere. You can do that. And a shout out to Bahe Shoes. I love this concept. You know, it's actually so funny. I saw this TikTok video and it was this couple that were cutting off the bottom of their shoes and and walking with their feet through the shoes barefoot so that they could get the benefits of grounding everywhere they went. Because obviously, if you go to places like a store, a restaurant, shoes are required. So they just cut off the soles, like the bottom of the shoes. And they were just walking around with their bare feet hidden underneath these shoes. And it was like, that's so creative and like get it. But you could also just buy grounding shoes and shoes that like connect you to Earth's frequency and get the benefits that way. Like that just makes way more sense, way more sense. So Baha Shoes does exactly that. They have really beautiful, really nice aesthetic shoes that are grounding. Great for people who are concerned about EMF, frequency, 5G, all of that, and want something that's actually practical. So they're sneakers. They're really nice. I have a pair of them. I wear them a lot. I don't walk barefoot a lot right now, especially not in the winter. So this is just like a nice thing to have in order to help with my body feeling more grounded. And I I notice a difference for sure. Like I definitely notice a difference when I feel more in my body and grounded. So check them out. You can use my discount code and link. That's Bahe spelled B-A-H-E, Bahe. And it is linked on my website as well, which all my discount codes and everything are if you're interested. And today's episode is all about cancer. So this is really interesting. We talked about cancer care, holistic and integrative cancer care. And how can we really approach this from a, a perspective of, you know, a biohacker's perspective or an optimal health perspective? And we dived, we dove into just the different modalities that you can use to help heal from cancer, including grounding, actually, including supplements and things like that. And we talk about the hospital that Dr. Nasha is building and just so many really cool, innovative, nuanced, like very, very forward thinking things. And I I just loved this episode. So I know there's going to be a bunch of people listening to this probably for the first time, listening to my podcast for the first time because they're here for this topic. So welcome. And I, I really hope you get a lot out of this episode and just some pointers on what you can do if you are handling or trying to heal from cancer yourself or a family or friend is. Family member, I can only imagine how hard that would be for you. I've had cancer in my family and my grandparents, and so I understand somewhat, you know, as much as I can. And I can definitely tell you that I did not know this information when that was happening many years ago. And they did not know this information either. So it's becoming more and more common. And I'm I'm happy to hear more people talking about taking a holistic and integrative approach to complicated and complex health conditions and issues like cancer. And what we talk about as well in this episode is the cancer rate impacting one in two now in America. So it's a pretty alarming statistic and it's pretty sad, to be honest, that it's that common now. So it just makes me makes me happy to feel somewhat educated in this space, like somewhat I know something about it because it might be a reality for me, for very close people to me one day. And it's a very hard thing to accept. So it's very, very sad, serious topic, but we still have to talk about it. So I think you will enjoy this episode 
feel free to leave a rating review. I look at all of them and I really appreciate when you take the time to do that. And you can follow me on Instagram at Biohacking Brittany or TikTok, which is just biohacking. And I will catch you on Friday for another episode. Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. Thank you for tuning into today's episode. This is a special episode because I have a fellow female biohacker joining me. She was actually part of the Women's Biohacking Conference. I think she was one of the speakers, Dr. Nisha Winters, who, I mean, I was a speaker there as well. It was an online conference last year in September. And I just remember getting connected and thinking, wow, I really need to have this woman on my show because she and I have so much in common. She specializes in integrative cancer care, which is completely out of my scope. So I am so excited to talk today and really just get to pick her brain so that I can learn a lot and you can learn a lot. So welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, Brittany, such an honor to be with you and your biohacking tribe. Yes, yes. So how did you first get into biohacking? Like what did that, what did that look like for your personal journey? Sure. Well, it's funny because at the time, I mean, this is how I'm, I'm an old lady now compared to you and the folks you listen to here. So 30 some years ago when I was diagnosed with cancer, I was left my own devices and would have been using what would likely today be consider, considered biohacking tools, which were things like helping reset my circadian rhythm, grounding, intermittent fasting, sweating. That time I was using, I was actually doing sweat lodges, not saunas, because I was doing a lot of ritual and ceremony around my healing process as well. So I was kind of like the OG biohacker of that world. I'm also by training a naturopathic physician. And we jokingly say that, you know, naturopaths were the sort of original biohackers. We do a lot of things which we term as nature cure. So these concepts of using these beautiful tools that were, that we kind of co-evolved with as tools to support and enhance our own healing. I love that. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Did you study in the States for that or did you study somewhere else? Gosh, that's a great question. I actually did my medical school training in the US, but I've spent 30 years traveling the world, observing, mentoring with, even working with or for various clinical environments, whether it was everything from hospital environments, pain management centers, to naturopathic nature cure clinics all over Europe, to Ayurvedic hospitals in India, including working in a leprosy hospital, applying nature cure therapies, including working with indigenous healers from all over the world and doing all types of, you know, playing in the realm of a lot of different herbal medicines, plant medicines, exploring different healing modalities within those, as well as in very, very conservative standard of care where I've done my clinical rotations. I've worked in AIDS clinics. I've worked in pain management centers. I've worked in hospitals. I've worked in ERs. I even did ride-alongs on fire, you know, with the fire department and ambulances and those things. So I've really had a beautiful, rich experience to know that each of these healing environments brings something to the table and that we don't have to like choose one or the other, there's a place for all of them at the table. One of the most important biohacks for me is grounding, taking off my shoes and connecting with the earth. There's lots of benefits to grounding, but a big one is how re-energizing it is. However, it's not always practical because we honestly just can't be barefoot all the time. That's the exact problem that Baja has solved with their game-changing grounding shoes. Life's hectic and going barefoot isn't always in the cards. By combining high-performance running shoes with grounding technology, they allow you to be grounded when you're on the move when going barefoot isn't possible. They are all about exercise cubed. It's not just about working out. It's about blending exercise, the great outdoors, and grounding. Your holistic well-being all in one pair of stylish kicks. They're not just another shoe brand. They're the first to fuse grounding tech with high-performance shoes, and you can feel the difference as you kiss goodbye to fatigue and stress. I know I definitely do. They currently have two different models, a traditional cushion style, which I love, and a more minimal barefoot style with a thin sole and wider foot designed for the ultimate natural feel. You can keep it real with their simple, cool, and versatile designs. If you're hitting the gym, grabbing coffee, doing errands, or going out for your daily walk. If you want to get these, you want to get the same shoes that I have, I really recommend you do. And if you're ready to be more grounded and healthier, 
you can head over to bahe.co and use my discount code biohackingbrittany to save 10%. I really recommend these and I think they are the ultimate companion for every biohacker out there. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. And I I just ask cuz I'm in Canada and I'm always curious about the like naturopathic or naturopathic program here and the people who who go and study it. And I think it's so interesting that you have had such a wide vast of experience that's really brought you to where you are today. So, how did you go from, you know, holistic health, kind of biohacking, naturopathic medicine to taking that and really looking at cancer with that type of lens? Great question. And so actually I kind of did it. I'm kind of like that bell-shaped curve type of thing where my world started actually as a patient and as a patient where the standard of care approach really missed the boat with me. It, it not only missed my diagnoses until it was too late, but it also kept layer caking my symptoms with more and more pharmaceuticals, which led to more and more symptoms, which led to more and more pharmaceuticals. You know, you get the gist that, that led to the eventual collapse of my body and a terminal cancer diagnosis at the age of 19, which left me with no options. They sent me to palliative care. Standard of care was not even an offering for me at that time. That's how far down the rabbit hole I had become. And so that's where I was left to my own devices. And so as I alluded to being like applying these, I was like the accidental biohacker. So for instance, I had a complete bowel blockage at that time. So I out of necessity, because it caused extreme pain or vomiting, I didn't eat for two and a half months. And that freaks people out when they hear that. That strategy, without knowing why, there was no Dr. Google in 1991, all right? This is this didn't exist. There was Dewey Decimal System and the microfiche for your research in, in those places. This We didn't have the resources we have today. So I accidentally ended up fasting just out of necessity. And then it somehow started to help my body resolve the buildup of what's known as malignant ascites, this buildup of fluid. I also started doing things like acupuncture. I started doing things like nature cure, like really getting out in nature as much as possible, laying on the earth, really being out in the sun. That's where my body felt like I could heal in those moments. So that's what led me down the path that eventually landed me in naturopathic medical school, which then took me to the other end of the spectrum getting all deeply, deeply, deeply integrated into standard of care. Because in naturopathic medicine, the first few years are basically no different than any standard of care medical school. Because you can't learn anatomy, biochemistry, physiology, microbiology, pathology. You can't learn those any other way but just to learn them. So I learned the same things that my standard of care colleagues learned. I had to take the same boards, you know, to get there. Where we deviate, though, is our philosophy and how we apply information, and how we view the body as an ecosystem, and how we view disease as a natural expression of something out of balance versus something as an external invader that must be treated. And so then I spent a nice lion's share of my time there. And frankly, Brittany decided I would never work with cancer because it was so, so intense and so traumatic. And I hid it very deeply in the vault of my history for fear of not getting, not for people kicking me out of undergrad for not getting into medical school, for people treating me like a cancer patient or like a victim and giving me sympathy where I didn't want that. I didn't want to associate being somebody sick. I just was a curious learner and wanted to understand why a 19-year-old would have this diagnosis, which sent me on the, the trail that I'm on today. But ultimately, at the end of the day, cancer came full circle, came back knocking and said, everything you learned from your own experience everything you learned in your world travels of putting together the best of what all medicines and all practices around the globe have to offer, all the things you've learned in being an expert in everything from endocrinology to autoimmune, you know, to immune dis- dysfunction and everything in between ultimately led to me meeting face-to-face with cancer again and helping support others on this journey. And so now I will tell you and your listeners to kind of tie this very big soliloquy up into a little bow is that the people who've made the biggest changes in medicine, in my opinion, over the last decade were not oncologists, were not cancer researchers. They were systems thinking people in the IT industry and frankly, biohackers. And so these are the people who have been, have a natural curiosity, who think in a systems thinking way, not in a myopic linear way, 
and who are about solutions driven versus putting bandages or playing whack-a-mole with problems. And that is where I feel like the biohacker world has brought a lot of tools and awareness and created a new conversation in the cancer landscape that didn't exist a decade ago. Yeah, I completely agree. If someone's listening to this for the first time and like listening to this podcast for the first time, and maybe they've never really heard of biohacking or holistic health, and then they start to hear us talking about integrative cancer care, and maybe they have somebody close to them who's had cancer or they themselves had cancer and they're kind of researching alternatives, kind of like what you did. So how can we start? Like, where can we start and say, okay, this is how we define integrative cancer care. And this is why it's actually very important. Perfect. Well, in all these fields, so whether it's biohacking, whether it's cancer treatment or prevention, whether it's integrative medicine in general, the idea is how to set your body up as the most optimal body it can possibly be. And with that comes also the most optimal mind, the most optimal spirit, the most optimal energy and vitality. Because to me, those all come as a package deal. They're not siloed as our current culture makes them out to be. And so that's the one area of kind of commonality of, for instance, when we look at labs today, in the United States, we base our lab values not on what is going to treat or prevent illness, but what is based on the average of the population. And we could spend all day just talking statistics right now, but just to put it simply, we do not have a healthy population, okay? In fact, statistics, if I can say that word, show that less than 6.8% of us in the United States And this likely transfers just as well in the UK, Europe, any major developed country in the world, less than 6.8% of us are considered metabolically healthy, which means that over, right, over 93% of us are walking around suboptimal in our health and well-being or lack thereof. That's number one. Number two, in the United States, we are the only country in the world that is losing longevity. And what I mean by that is everybody else on the planet, they're either stable with their longevity or improving upon it. Yet for the past five years in a row in the United States, we are dropping in our overall, like we're increasing our mortality and dropping in our longevity across the board. What scientists would call the reason for this is what they call the era of despair, which is where the thing that is lowering our longevity is the outcomes that happens with overdose opiate overdose, and suicide, which that alone should also elucidate that we are not well in mind, body, and spirit for something like that to be what snuffs our candle out far too early. And then moving into the space of cancer, cancer has now outpaced, unfortunately, cardiovascular disease as the number one cause of death worldwide. The World Healthcare Organization says that cancer statistics will double worldwide by the year 2030, which is just a handful of years away. And that now one in two of us are expected to meet this diagnosis. That should plant a seed in your listeners' minds, bodies, and souls that something's not right, that we're missing something, and that more needs to be done. Interstage left, the realm of the concept of integrative medicine, meaning Don't just focus on the myopic, like don't just go to a cardiologist to work on your heart, a nephrologist to work on your kidney, an oncologist to work on your tumor cells or tumor, you know, bulk, a, you know, a psychiatrist to work on your psyche, you know, a naturopath to work on your, on your natural therapies, a nutritionist to work on this. You need to weave together a beautiful quilt of basically putting together your own board of directors on your healthcare team. And this is where the the world of integrative medicine, biohacking medicine, health optimization, basically are the answer to a growing problem globally. Do you know if you're getting enough magnesium? Because four out of five Americans aren't. And that's a big problem because magnesium is involved in more than 300 biochemical reactions in your body. Today, I want to talk to you about the most common signs to look for that could indicate you're magnesium deficient. Listen carefully to the end because there's a special offer happening and this could be exactly what you need. Okay, here we go. Are you irritable or anxious? Do you struggle with insomnia? 
Do you experience muscle cramps or twitches? Do you have high blood pressure? Are you sometimes constipated? There are dozens of symptoms of magnesium deficiency, so these are just a few of the most common ones. Now, here's what most people don't know. Taking just any magnesium supplement won't solve your problem because most supplements use the cheapest kinds that your body can't use or absorb. That's why I exclusively recommend Magnesium Breakthrough. It's the only full-spectrum magnesium supplement with seven unique forms of magnesium that your body can actually use and absorb. All Bioptimizer supplements are best in class, which is why I use them. If for some reason you feel differently, you can get a full refund, no questions asked. They are so confident that they offer a 365-day money-back guarantee. Just go to bioptimizers.com slash biohackingbrittany. In addition to the discount you get by using my promo code biohackingbrittany, you get gifts with your purchase. That's right. You actually get gifts up to two travel size bottles of magnesium breakthrough. So act fast. This is a limited time offer. You can go to bioptimizers.com slash biohackingbrittany. Use my code. It's linked in my show notes on my website and start taking your magnesium today. I love that answer. And I I think you're spot on. I think taking a comprehensive holistic approach makes a lot of sense. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily do it because there could be accessibility issues and affordability issues. And a lot of it, I really do think is self-taught. Like you you have to listen to the podcasts and you have to buy the books and educate yourself so that you understand, oh, I can try X, Y, and Z that might help, which, you know, a month ago I had no idea about, right? And there's no one telling you all of these things. Like you really have to take ownership and responsibility for your own health. And yeah, I, I don't really see that a lot in mainstream medicine necessarily. Kind of, I mean, it's getting better, but it's it's definitely not where I think it should be. In Yeah. In terms of integrative therapies, do you have any that you specifically love for cancer care that you've seen that have worked, you know, really well? Yes. Well, before we go to that, I would love to pick up on something you started to speak about here, which is accessibility. Okay. And, and so that's a gripe I hear all the time when people, you know, this is where people will assume that the role of an integrative oncologist, an integrated healthcare provider, or a biohacker is somehow a role only for the privileged, okay? That's what is put out there into the world. That is a belief system, and frankly, it's a myth. Because I'm gonna tell you something for your listeners. When I was 19 years old, okay, facing my mortality given less than three months to live without a freaking penny in my pocket, okay, in the hole in my bank account, the first person to go to college in my family to break that that generational poverty and trauma that I came from, to break those patterns, I had to take out tons of Pell Grants, student loans. I was on work study and I was on a partial volleyball scholarship. I worked 60 hours a week in a variety of environments. I waited tables. I worked in childcare. I worked as a CNA in a nursing home. And I worked as a C, what's known as a CAC, which is a certified addictions counselor in a detox center. I worked all those jobs while I was a freshman, sophomore in college. I literally slept in a total of two to three hours a day, not in a row. I took naps between all my jobs, between all my coursework, because I was also dual major biology and chemistry. I wanted to be a doctor. I had no help. I had no reserves. I lived in a TP for two years. I lived in a barn. I lived in my car. I did whatever it took to save my my ass, frankly. My patients call it SYA University, Save Your Ass University. I had to take matters in my own hands because no one was going to do it for me. There, were, I was uninsured. I had no family support. I had no financial resources. So when people say this is for the privileged, I am living proof as are dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of patients like me who have done this on their own without sexy, expensive tools and resources that is free and available or very, very low cost and available to each and every one of us. So I just want to, I just want to drop that, that belief system that people might carry if that's keeping you in a victimized state and encourage you to like figure it out. You will find resources to take care of yourself. And for us, sunshine is free. Fasting is free. Thought 
game changing and rewiring your thoughts are free. Vagal nervous system toning and stimulation and support is free. You know, so toning, singing, stretching, chanting, those are all tools of strengthening your vagal nerve response, which is your stress response. So those are examples for your listeners that those are often the most underutilized tools on the cancer journey. And yet I will tell you, those are also the most important. And so the sexy therapies we're getting ready to talk about, they will only be as good as the environment in which we apply them to. So if those fundamentals are not addressed, if you are not dealing with your circadian rhythm, if you are constantly in panic mode, searching the internet at 2 a.m. for treatments that you could go and take, you are actually causing your cancer to grow, right? If you are staying in the really toxic relationship or the toxic job, you are encouraging that cancer to grow. If you are continuing to feed your face with what you perceive as the cheap food, because that's what you can afford, you will feed that cancer. Good, healthy, quality food is available to all. And through a variety of means, such as taking part and being part of a CSA, volunteering in an organic farm where you get out there and pull a few weeds every day to get your food share. There are so many creative ways to get access and more programs like this opening up globally. So I really wanted to highlight that. But now we can shift gears to what are some of the sexy therapies that are well vetted, where characterized, that are making a dent in the cancer conversation. And to me, the, the most foundational is what I just talked about, about sort of the, what I call my CDC, my version of the CDC, instead of Center for Disease Control, mine is about circadian rhythm, diet, and community. Those are foundational for our success in any healthcare, but in particular in the cancer, in the cancer conversation. On top of that, more specific to the diet, is about when you eat is just as important as what you eat. So making sure you are focusing on eating within the light of day. And that will change as the seasons change, right? That will be also about looking at starting to, depending on who you are, what your situations are, what your goals are, you might be looking at intermittent fasting. For the most part, all of us should be fasting every single day for 13 hours, meaning finish dinner and don't have anything but water before you break your fast 13 hours later. That's where we should all be naturally and organically. And that puts you in a state of metabolic resilience, metabolic flexibility. But for some people, they need to push it harder, maybe a couple times a week, twice, twice a week, 16 to 18 hours a day fasting, maybe once a month, 36 hours to a five, five day a month fasting again under some medical supervision, which can act as an anti-cancer agent in and of itself. There is so much research in this department that my friends is free, right? And then the other tool that's very powerful is just like using therapeutic diets. So sometimes it's appropriate to have a high fat, low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. Sometimes it's important to just have a carbohydrate restricted diet that induces ketones. Sometimes it's important to bring on exogenous ketones. The point is, is there are multiple roads to Rome, but ketone bodies themselves, no matter how you achieve them, impact all of the hallmarks of cancer simultaneously. I can't think of a more potent and powerful tool than to harness the power of ketones to use this. And there's a variety of ways to achieve that. Next, the power of heat. We, people like Hippocrates said all the way back, let, you know, if I give me a fever and I can cure any disease. And we've spent the last 75 years suppressing fever to the point where even our natural body temperatures have dropped in the last two generations. And we are facing crises where our body doesn't even know how to harbor a real fever. And if it does, we tend to rush to suppress it. And that, my friends, is how our body does her, does the job to clean up the, the riffraff, to get what doesn't belong out of there and to strengthen what belongs there. So things like saunas or even in places like Europe and even areas in the United States, medical hyperthermia which we induce a fever at levels of above 103 in a medical environment to induce apoptosis of cancer cells, destruction of cancer cells. Another tool that's underutilized is high-dose IV vitamin C in the right place and time. It's therapy we use to basically harness your body's endogenous iron levels to turn it into a smart bomb and target your cancer cells. It's a tool that in high doses through intravenous acts as a pro-oxidant, which induces 
cytotoxic, meaning cell kill of your cancer cells. It also is very immunomodulating and balancing, and it targets very specifically something known as a KRAS mutation. And so that is one of the leading drivers of a lot of our cancer types today is this particular mutation that vitamin C and a therapeutic ketogenic diet tend to target directly, just as an example. So things like high doses of, of certain nutrients, such as vitamin D, vitamin C, melatonin can be harnessed. Off-label drugs such as low-dose naltrexone, mabendazole, dipyridamol are some of the things that can be harnessed and things like heat in a therapeutic environment and dietary interventions between ketosis, glutamine restriction, methionine restriction. I'm rattling this off to all of you, not to say go out and do all these things because they will only be as effective as they are in the individual that needs them and in the environment in which it's received. So there is no one way. And this is what standard of care doesn't like. They want one treatment to treat a whole multitude of things, which fails us every single time. We are not one target and one treatment. We are multiple targets that need multiple inputs based on the individual. And what I train doctors to learn today is how to know the right dose, the right timing, the right duration, and the right combination, whether it's standard of care re- repurposed whether it's off-label drugs, whether it's particular supplements, nutrients, particular therapeutic diets, or even particular interventions such as hyperthermias, hyperbaric oxygen, et cetera, I help doctors know when and where and how to use these therapies most effectively based on the individual's need at any given time. I love that. And I completely agree with everything that you said. When I You know, honestly, it's so similar to some of the other conversations that I have when I talk about different health problems. Like when I have discussions about longevity and cellular health and cellular cleanup, we're we're talking about fasting and saunas and like going to bed on time and watching how much EMF you're around. Like it it's a lot of the same points in and it's it makes sense that it supports something like longevity and cellular health. And it helps manage cancer cells. And even when I, I talk to women about hormone balancing or fertility and, and those types of issues as well, it's very similar. So I think I, I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of, a lot out of this just in general, because I just think there's a lot to be said about building a foundation of your health and building these pillars before adding in you know, a one-off supplement or a one-off IV or something that you think is like a quick fix. Like you really have to have these foundations down before you adopt something that, you know, sounds sexy and is like more expensive and you think it's going to work really quickly. Like, you know, no one really wants to do the whole (laughs) outside walking barefoot, exercise every day, get sleep, right? We're kind of tired of hearing that, but so many of us still don't do it. Exactly. Exactly. Or if we do it, we're like, okay, I did it once and I'm done. No, this is a practice and it accum- it builds on itself. So it's not something you do. It's a one and done. It's something that you have to commit to every single day of this deep self-care. Yeah, exactly. The habits really do stack up when you do it every single day. And every single day you do it, it does count. That's what I also like to encourage people is if you go outside and do a walk today, that does count. That does matter. You know, don't think it was just something small that you did, but like it does, it does add up. It really does. Something I find interesting is that you have done a lot of research into mistletoe, which is something that I was surprised to see because, you know, we all know mistletoe from the holidays, but how does it fit into cancer care and, and why is it significant? Love it. Well, I was going to bring that up, but I knew you were going to probably take us there eventually here, but that's one of the other tools. And it fits in that same category as a warming therapy, a fever therapy. And mistletoe therapy beyond, you know, making out under it over the holidays is the most studied integrative oncology therapy in the world. It has been used continuously in the form that we still use it in today as an extract of the mistletoe, 
Whereas we take a little bit of the leaf, a little bit of the berry, we pulverize it, we put it through kind of this semisifuge process while dripping or potentizing it with a aqueous solution. And then we put it into an injectable form that can be taken subcutaneously, intravenously, even intravesicularly, which means into the bladder, intraperitoneally, which means into the abdominal space, intratumorally, meaning injected directly into the tumors, et cetera. This has been a therapy ongoing since 1917, folks. If you are a patient in cancer, in cancer, if you're a patient in Europe and you live in places like Switzerland or Germany, you have an 85% chance of getting this medicine as some part of your cancer journey. If you live anywhere else in Europe, you have a 45% chance of having this. Most people in the United States have never heard of it, right? It's part of the medical pharmacopoeia in Canada in Mexico, in South America, in India, and all over Southeast Asia. And yet in America, we in US, we hear hardly anything about it. We have a clinical trial, a safety trial, which is sort of silly that we wasted time, money, and resource in nearly a decade to show that it's safe, despite that there are 2,600 clinical trials around the world showing its safety and efficacy, including 250 of those trials that would be considered top standard RCT design studies that are even like the gold star in US. Yet, because we're US, because we think our poo doesn't stink, we had to go through this process and waste tons of time and valuable resources to prove that it's safe and effective. And so I don't need my patients to wait for studies to come out to know that this has been used for over 100 years effectively in a variety of environments, including hospitals. I'm taking a group of doctors in the fall of 2024 to Germany and Switzerland to go to hospitals inpatient hospitals where patients are getting their IV mistletoe along with their chemotherapy, their radiation, their surgery, along with their hyperthermia, along with their high-dose IV vitamin C and nutritional therapies, it is not considered alternative, right? It is just standard of care. So mistletoe is this semi-parasitic plant that now that you've heard about it and you go look it up, you'll realize you see it all the time. There's over 3,600 species globally. But there's a handful that grow very particularly in this region of, of, the, of Europe known as the Black Forest region. So Austria, Italy, uh, France, Germany, and Switzerland all kind of share this sort of terroir, this sort of region where these particular host trees and this particular host mistletoe grows that has a particular lectin content that seems really conducive to an anti-cancer approach. So it contains certain Certain, can, certain things like lectins and proteins and immunotherapies that are very, very helpful in helping our body respond in a more favorable way in the treatment of cancer. So this therapy is by no means a standalone. It was always meant to play well with others, though I have dozens, if not hundreds of cases where as a standalone, it did a really good job of helping people get their cancer into remission. But it's always been one to play well with others to help you overcome the side effects of standard of care, to keep your blood counts high, to keep your energy high, to lower toxicity and side effects, to keep your liver function good, which is where the toxicity seems to take a toll, and to really help with like the cancer-related fatigue and treatment fatigue and just overall sense of quality of life. This therapy to me is a must adjuvant support to any of our standard of care therapies today. And it's a really good therapy to continue long after you ring that bell after the completion of chemo or radiation to help your body clean up the damage of those treatments, which are very real, and help you maintain remission, which is really, really key. And so we actually have a book out that I co-wrote with six other authors from hematological oncologists to conventional medical doctors to another naturopath and myself who probably collectively have over a thousand years of experience in mistletoe. We've been at this for a long dang time. Not really, probably a couple hundred years between us in using this. But this book is called Mistletoe and the Emerging Future of Integrative Oncology. And it really goes into the history of mistletoe, the studies, the research about mistletoe, its mechanism of action, uh, the current findings and applications, how to know when, where, and how and why to use it, how to order it, how to pres- how to prescribe it, who to find to help you prescribe it because it is a prescription only, needs to be supported with a a physician who's been trained in how to use this. It's not a protocol. It's a patient-driven treatment. And you go from there, but it is an injection. And so a lot of people say, well, I took a tincture and it didn't work, or I saw that there's pills. I'll take those instead because I don't like to do needles. But we only show efficacy thus far. Studies could still happen and show us otherwise, but they don't exist. 
but it needs to bypass the the digestive juices because those lectins that are anti-cancer get easily degraded in our digestive juices. It's also something we want it to avoid the liver uh, detox pathways. So that's why as an injection, it plays so well with others that it's not contraindicated to take with chemo, targeted drugs, et cetera, because it's not utilizing the detox pathways of the liver. So it's virtually side effect free outside of some local desired cytokine reactions of like an itchiness, a local redness, maybe a low grade fever. You know, that's what we want for the immune response here. But it's a very powerful therapy that I think is its day has come for people in the West and particularly in the United States to know that it's available to them. And that book, we hope, is a book of best practices to help educate and empower clinicians as much as patients on this journey. Yeah, I love that. I think it's I think it's so profound that you've spent so much time researching that and uncovering it and explaining it. And you have a book and I think that's awesome. And I, I really encourage everyone listening to you get that book. I'll add it to the show notes so that they can just explore other ways of healing and can kind of look outside of the norm. Because like you said, like I have not heard of that. I am not really in the cancer care space, but I'm still in the holistic health and biohacking space. And that's something that I haven't heard of. And so I could only imagine people listening to this being like, what mistletoe? How does that work? You know, do you, when you work with or patients one-on-one, do you get pushback with that? Or kind of like, is there this, I guess the standard education that you have to provide to be able to take them from, hey, I don't understand what you're talking about to, oh, okay, I get this. I definitely want to try this therapy. What a great question, Brittany. I love, I love your thought process because you're taking me right down to the pain points that we see, you know, in, in those that we serve. And, you know, this, this idea, because I've all, I've always been an outlier in just my own life and an outlier in the way I think and practice and the outlier in my actual training, right? I've just even chose a profession that's considered an outlier. I'm always up against the pushback. But I'm also that person who will tell you that if you tell me that it can't be done, I'm like, get the F out of my way because I'm doing it. So, that's my, like, you guys are my double dog dare that really pushes me to go. That's also the type of person that seems to be drawn into my world are other people with that same idea of like, don't tell me what to do. I know my body. I know what's needed. I know how to go about this, but I do it, you guys, through data. I'm also, my other side of my brain is very data driven. So I don't just throw protocols and ideas at people. I throw reality based on the feedback your body gives me through a variety of testing imaging, questionnaires, physical diagnoses, you know, all the different things, even functional testing, like what else is driving the train here? And then we know exactly what our priorities are and how to best address them and in what order. So with that, the pushback is always there. The pushback is there is patients who are new to this saying, well, gosh, it's really expensive. You know, will my insurance cover it? No, no, it will not. Insurance will only cover chemo, radiation, surgery, targeted therapy. It is not interested in having conversations on prevention. It is not interested in having conversations on how better to utilize these therapies in less toxic ways. So until we build the model model that I'm building, so I spent 20 years trying to fix this current broken system that's futile. I'm done with that. I spent the last 15 years, actually, or 12 years going out to build a new one, which we're doing very successfully. We've now trained 200 clinicians and 300 advocates with two cohorts a year matriculating, you know, annually across 36 countries. We are, we are building out a data platform to show the translational data that everything we are showing that our patients are actually having better outcomes than just doing standard of care. So we're able to show that. We are opening in spring of 2024, our metabolic research lab, metabolomics lab in Arizona to start to actually do the research on these types of products from cell line studies to animal studies to human studies, even down to cellular respiration studies to know, does this therapy do what it says it's doing? Whether that's coming from pharmaca, you know, big pharma, or from the alternative world, we're going to be helping define that and see what's going on. And we're also building um, on a 1,200-acre organic regenerative farm, the first of its kind in the world, residential, integrative, metabolic oncology hospital and research institute where we are helping show people how to live healthy on an unhealthy planet, you know, with 150 beds and all the therapies, the best of what standard of care has to offer with the best of what vetted integrative therapies are coming in globally are under one roof. 
where folks can come and have deeply impactful, you know, healing immersions, bringing in the best of all the tools. So we are bucking against a system that's very broken and very much a naysayer to what it is we're creating. So instead of getting distracted by that and spending 20 years like I did trying to convince them, instead, we're just building something new and we're just showing them that it's being done. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that. I love that so much. The future hospital idea is fascinating. I think there is something to be said about being an example for those around you rather than just telling them or lecturing them, right? Like show them how it's done, show them the success, and then they'll be like, oh, okay, we need to do this as well. And the hospital that you're building is very cool. It's really, really cool. It's a comprehensive metabolic oncology hospital, and you have regenerative farming, you have EMF mitigation. I mean, the fact that you're building a facility that even factors in EMF is just like makes me so happy, like just so happy because that's somewhere I would want to go. So are you are you open yet or are you guys still working on it? We're still working. We're in the fundraising phase of this. We have the land donated. We've got our initial plans. We've got the start of our permitting process. If you have any billionaire friends who want to leave a legacy and change healthcare, um, as we know it, because we don't really have a healthcare system, we have a disease management system. So if people are like, I'm ready to shake this up, we have all the things in place. We can show performance. We can show it all. We've got philanthropic opportunities. We also have for-profit opportunities because this campus also has a wellness destination component, farm to table, restaurants, a culinary school, an event center, mixed residential, mixed commercial, all in the green space. And so there's a lot going on with the with the hospital and this wellness being the core, the heart and soul, if you will, of this campus. We also expect this campus to be just the sort of the mothership, the sort of flagship that we will have many large and small versions and satellites of it spreading across globally. So that is both the long, the short and the long version. Why we're opening the lab and focusing our, our care there first, because it's easier to ask for a hundred for six six million dollars to get the lab off the ground versus $180 million to get the hospital off the ground. But even the prototypes of the products we have in the hopper that would be of use to the biohacker world, the cancer world, the pharmacology world, the testing world, we've got a lot of things that are already proof in concept that have already gone through beta testing that we're now developing. Any one of the products that will come out of our nonprofit lab, we already know would fund the entire hospital. That's how certain we are of that success. So we think our goal is to have the doors of this hospital open in three years. Funding can hap- make it happen upwards of 18 months or at least phase of it to have it available up to 18 months with the right resources but we have an amazing goal and we have, you know, we've got an amazing, you know, journey ahead of us, but the things are aligning so fast. This has been 32 years in the making guys. And what happened in the last several years feels like we're like on, you know, like a jet pack of energy, but what's happened in the last six months, it's, it's almost like warp speed. It's hard to keep up with myself. My DNA does not know what's happening <laughs> right now as we're full on warp speed because people are coming out of the woodwork. When you have billionaires, when you have family foundations, when you have institutions that have thrown millions, if not billions of dollars away at the current broken system, and they realize it's not moved the dial one iota in the cancer space, And when you have people who have unlimited resources to go all over the world and get the best of care that standard care has to offer, and yet they still die of cancer, or they're still cancering, or they're still struggling, and they come and see somebody trained by me, or historically by me when I was still in direct private practice, I now consult four patients with their doctors on their behalf. And that's where I focus now. But when these billionaires start to realize, well, something at a fraction of the cost in the big picture that's more effective than what I've done thus far, putting me into remission or a deep state of maintenance and stabilization, suddenly they're coming out of the woodwork saying, this is where I'm interested in putting my energy. And that's what's very exciting to me is that momentum is picking up and we're finding each other. We're magnetizing in a movement, folks. This is not a one and done. This is so much bigger than me or anyone that's come on board and we're making a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm so happy to hear that. And I can't wait to visit one day. I just want to go see it. It's like a biohacking hospital. Why would I not want to see that? Like, it just sounds epic. Like, it really does sound epic. 
And I hope that you, I'm not sure if you do or like other people on your team, I hope you really present it at these like biohacking health optimization conferences, because I think there would be so many people who would be interested in being a part of it in some form and like helping it get it off the ground because it really just symbolizes what we all believe in. And I'm very excited for you. Thank you, Brittany. And you know, my big lesson at all of this is I, I was such an island with all of this in the beginning. I thought I had to do it alone. And what gives me chills right now, just standing here with you and, and actually I feel the emotion in my body and my being is that I don't have to do this alone. And you're a great reminder to me that there are so many others looking for exactly what it is that I've envisioned and what I'm creating and what now dozens, if not hundreds of people are helping me create, which will, you know, move now. Like if you think about our doctors, we have 200 doctors currently with more, we have another group of 40 starting next week. On average, they see 250 cancer patients a year. Just think of those numbers right there. Think about that reach right there and think about the ripple right there. And we're just getting started. And so I really appreciate that reminder to say when I'm in those environments, of which I will be. I mean, last year I was on 46 stages for crying out loud globally. I'm getting ready to be on some big ones and some more big biohacker ones this year. You're right. I need to be able to say, who's in? Who wants to help us leave a different, leave leave our healthcare system better than we found it? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you for saying that. My last question for you is on your website, you have something, you have a line that says cancer, cancer will take root in half of all men and one third of all women. And I saw that and I was like, I wonder why there's a difference. So I'm so curious what your hypothesis is about the rates in men versus women if you, if you have any inclinations. Well, it's funny you should ask that because we actually, you just reminded me that we are now outdated with that statistic. Okay. Because the statistic is now one in two, period. Half of us, man, woman, and child will experience cancer in their lifetime. And so that does change. But my hypothesis before is frankly, when you look at integrative medicine historically, 80% of our patients were women. 80% of the population interested in health and prevention and integrative medicine were women. Frankly, men wait until it's basically fallen off or bleeding out (laughs) before they do anything about it. And so for women, they often preempt by self-care. But today we're all running like little like gerbils on a gerbil wheel or a hamster on a hamster wheel that we're all in the same place of toxicity of not taking care of ourselves. We're all getting exposed to all the endocrine disruptors and the EMF exposures and the micro RNA injections and the infections of these viruses that are coming around that are impacting the same receptor sites that are kicking up all of these other metabolic pathways to make us more susceptible to all kinds of conditions, including cancer, et cetera. Suddenly, unfortunately, the playing field has equalized and we're all just as vulnerable no matter your gender and no matter your age. Yeah, I think that makes so much sense. I was kind of thinking along the same lines of the wellness and self-care tends to be more in the female realm. It's getting better, but there is something to be said about women being more proactive possibly than men. But it's also sad now that that statistic is one in two, no matter what. And, you know, it's sad that that has increased since the last time you wrote that because you know, we don't want that. We want to be moving in the other direction. So thankfully, you know, we have people like you and everything that you're building to really help us do that. If people want to connect with you and work with you or potentially get involved in your hospital or other projects that you're doing, how can they do that? And and where can they find you? Thanks for that opportunity, Brittany. Please, folks, please, the probably the best place to kind of umbrellas it all is M as in Mary, T-I-H dot org. And that stands for Metabolic Terrain Institute of Health.org. It's our nonprofit 501c3. On there, you'll also get links back to my, the brand, Dr. Nasha Inc., which is me and all of my public speaking, my books, my podcasts, my interviews, all the things, right, that help you understand who I am and where I've come from and why this is such a passion and purpose for me. It's also going to show you, take link you into our data platform, MTOmics, which is Metabolic Terrain Omics, which is our data platform. It will also link you into our newly released podcast, which is Metabolic Matters, 
which you can also have a listen to some of the movers and shakers in this space that are leaving an imprint to make this world better better than they found it. And you're joining arms with people like Brittany to do this. It will also have a list of all the events and the places where I speak and present and and learn from and get inspired by. So you can do the same. So that's a really great place. It also has our training programs, both for our, our, our clinicians, our patient advocates, and soon to be for just the general lay public who wants kind of a do-it-yourself approach. Gosh, I'm sure I'm missing a few things, but it's a pretty big, broad stroke and has information on there that says, basically, how do you, how can you help? And it has a drop bar that shows a variety of ways. Maybe you've got some expertise in certain areas that you want to advise on. Maybe there's some ways you can donate time or energy, not just financial. So please, this is a global movement, all hands on deck, and we welcome whatever contributions you're willing to make. Yes, perfect. I love, I love that. And I will put that in the show notes and on my website so that everyone can find you very easily and just get involved in any way that, that they can, like you said. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast. This was an awesome episode. It was great to connect with you. And I, I think everyone definitely got a lot out of this. Thank you so much, Brittany. And I definitely look forward to hearing from your listeners. If they've got questions, there's also ways to reach out on that mtih.org for follow-up questions as well. So thank you. And thank you for shining your light in the world. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.